All right. Uh, it, it's, uh, man, I'm telling you, it's just such a blessing to be up here. And even as I get into this and um, just knowing, um, you know, keep praying for my wife. She's out of town. Uh, there's a few people out of town this weekend. Different reasons, though. Um, as uh, we told you guys uh, last time, um, I just had a new grandson born. Uh, and his name is Kevin Andrew Constantine. No, Alexander Constantine. There you go. Uh, and and uh, he was seven pounds, five ounces, 20 inches long. I remember that. Uh, but like, like I said, I don't do well with names. Uh, even my kids often get called, hey, you. And come here, dummy, right? Uh, so, <laughs> so uh, you know, so bless the Lord. My wife is still uh, there in Houston helping out uh, my daughter and should be back either Wednesday or Thursday. So, uh, and it's just awesome. I uh, love it. And, you know, looking forward to spending more time with the grandkids. But uh, let's get into today's message. If you would, join me to pray for it. Father, as we come to you right now, Lord, uh, Looking at this, your word, knowing, Lord, that we are called to, to such a great time, Lord. These are, as, as we've read and as we have seen, as we have gone through the book of Acts, we are in the latter days, Lord. We are in the end times. We were born into a time which is leading to the end of all things. Father, help us as we look at these things that we would see, Lord, your great mercies, your great provision, your great love for us. That we would look, Lord, at, at not the things of this world. Father, we sing the song that says the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of your glory and grace. Lord, help that to be true in our lives, that we would not... Look at the circumstances or the things in our lives as something that drive whether or not you are with us. But we would be driven, Lord, by your glory, by your grace. Help us, Lord, to see what it is you have for us. And do this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, as I come into this, just having even prayed for someone to be healed this morning, uh, we're coming into Acts chapter 3, if you'd like to go ahead and turn there. Um, and, and we'll read it together here in just a moment. Again, I'm using a New King James Version of the Bible. And, you know, I, I, I seem hesitant. It's because I'm sharing a story that has been in my family for a long time. I actually called and talked to my mom last night just to make sure I had all the details right. Because as you can see, I can't even remember my own grandson's name. So, uh, but we're coming into an area where we're beginning to really see not Jesus healing people. For most of us, we would think, you know, Jesus, he's, you know, God incarnate. You know, he is the word made flesh that dwelt among us. So we don't look at it so much as, as we don't look at Jesus as, whoa, Jesus healed people. We're like, well, one would kind of expect if God came, he would do these things. But now we begin to see that he begins to do these things with his church, with his people, um, specifically Peter and John as we come into this. But <clears throat> the subject of what's going on here has become a subject of heated debate within the church today. Um, and, I, and I did pray. I prayed about looking at this debate, about seeing these things. But why would I want to do that? Why would I want to bring debate into something that doesn't call for it. We are supposed to be guided by these scriptures, not the theology of man, not the practice teachings of particular sects, churches, denominations, or anything else. But what does the word have to say to us? Because if I let those things drive what we do, then we'll begin to get caught in that instead of just seeing what God has to say to us. These same kind of teachings and discussions can hurt families. I want to share a personal story with you. My mom's sister, Patricia, back uh, in the late 50s, um, she was about 20 years old, actually less than that. I want to say she had Bright's disease for many years. 
um, which back in the 50s, it was, it's, it's basically a kidney disease. And it was very painful, very difficult to handle. Um, and a, a member of the family at that time, that's back when, you know, faith healers were starting to become really big, and they would do the tent revivals and things like that. And <coughs> a tent revival had come into town, and an aunt came and said, I want to take Patricia there to be healed. Um, my mom and her family were not really people of the Bible. They were, you know, Christian because they were American kind of thing um, and uh, really didn't attend church or have a faith to speak of. Uh, so this aunt, you know, hey, it was their daughter was dying. Her sister was dying. You know, everything we could, they would do. So they said, fine, take her. So she, she took her to the revival, and when they came back, obviously she had not been healed. Um, and on December 31st of 1960, Patricia, at the age of 20, died. Having been told by people of faith that she was not healed because her faith was not strong enough. And when I became a believer, that was one of the things that I had to encounter with my mom. That was her earliest encounter with faith. Was somebody telling her her sister died because she didn't have enough faith. So when we come into this, I want you to know that I come into this and my heart is filled with the Holy Spirit because I, I don't see what I think that these people see that taught them this. I just want to look at the word and what it has to say to us. So let's just read the whole encounter real quick. <clears throat> Acts chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a certain lame man from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, my allergies are killing me. Um, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on them with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Verse 11, now as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at us? Or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob the God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One, the just, and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. Verse 16, in his name, through faith in his name has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. 
For Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow as many as spoken have also foretold these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from your iniquities. Man, isn't that powerful? And when you read these things and you see these things and you know that God calls you to partake in this same spirit, that, that the Holy Spirit that dwells in Peter here also dwells in you. So now let's, we're going to look today at, at a message I've entitled Name. And we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 12, um, which talks about the miracle and then starts going in. It's like a transition into the, uh, uh, into the message that Peter just gave. So let's look at it. Um, let's look at it in detail. Let's see. Verse 1. Now, Peter and John went up to, to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. Uh, now, there are three times of prayer during the day that they would have. They would pray at 9 in the morning, 12, and 3 p.m. And all those were kind of close to the times that they would do uh, the sacrifices, the, the morning and the evening one. So basically they would come in and either watch and take part in the sacrifice, then they would do their time of prayer and leave, or they would come in and, and you know, vice versa. But they would all get there around that time to do that. And then we see Peter and John coming in, <clears throat> and there's a lot of things you could extrapolate from that. Some might look at it and go, were they still practicing that practice that Jesus had done with them when he sent out the 70 and he sent them by twos? You know, so everywhere they went, they had a compatriot there. And, you know, some people, you might even kind of put together that they're saying they do this because of the idea of, um, you know, what we get from Moses in Deuteronomy. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses shall so something be established. So... They always wanted to have at least two of them there, so if God did a miracle, there would be a witness. There would be a testimony. It wouldn't just be Peter would come in and say, hey, man, I part of some water today, but John would be there to go, yeah, you know, this happened, that kind of thing, right? But it could just be because they were buddies. In uh, Luke 5.10, it says not only were they, you know, they knew each other, they were in a fishing business together. So they're close, um, we know that when the women came back and they told, uh, and Peter was with John even after he had denied Jesus, and John had brought him in with him, and that when the women had come back and said, hey, the tomb's empty, you know, they had that foot race that John had to let us know he won, remember? Right? So, you know, it's like, I, 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 why are they together? Because God made it so. Because God did it. Um, these friends... Uh, these ones that have been through so much and have seen a risen Lord are now together. And, and, and again, as we get into this, an, another thing to note is you see they're still Jews. They're still very Jewish in, in, in their faith. Um, they didn't come to Jesus and then go, ha, we can cast all the law off now. We don't have to do any of those things. You know, there was none of that. Um, the Christian faith, as it were, even as we read it and as we look at it, is very Ju it, it, it is Judaism. It truly is. And you and I, as we look at it, we can't separate that because the Holy Spirit shows us here that they were going to the temple to pray. Now, God would, as time went by, and as we see going through the book of Acts, we see God beginning to change the doctrines and their teachings we even see a point at one time where a lot of people were complaining about Paul because he was preaching to Gentiles like you and me and, and you know, and, and telling them they didn't have to obey the law. And other people were going, no, 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 they got to become Jews. They have to convert. They have to, you know, they, they have to have all the right cuts and all the right places, right? And, and they was like, no. And then they went to, you know, they actually came back to Jerusalem. And James stood up, who was the leader of the church at the time, and said, nah, they, they, you know, if they want to know the law, they can go to the synagogues. They're all over the place. But don't 
put a burden on them that even we couldn't do, Peter said. And that's going to be later on in the book of Acts. But we see here where God has already begun to bring thousands of people to Christ through Peter and the apostles. And the whole purpose of it we, we have discussed in the past is that they, he was making missionaries. These were all people that were coming in from all these nations and, bringing in, and, and they were bringing them in, becoming believers, and then going back out with everything they had been taught. Uh, verse 2, a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms from those who enter the temple. Verse 3, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. Now, this is one of the gates entering the sanctuary proper. Uh, Josephus, who was a Christian historian, is like one of the only ancient mentions of this particular gate called beautiful. He said um, there were nine gates that were overlaid with silver and gold going into the temple proper. So if you were going into the temple, you know, past, uh, I think it was going into the court of women, these, there would be these huge gates, and they would be overlaid with silver and gold. But this particular gate, Josephus said, was made out of pure Corinthian bronze and was more valuable than any of the other gates, even though they were overlaid with silver and gold. Uh, and it took 20 men to open and close the doors at the beginning and the end of the day. And this seems to be the same gate uh, mentioned in rabbinic literature as the Nicanor Gate. What does all that mean? It means they were at a really pretty gate, right, going into the temple. It means that here laid this guy who was crippled. He was crippled from birth. Now, the Levitical law about someone being crippled and, uh, and, you know, maimed, like if you were born with a defect, if you were born, uh, you know, with any number of, of defects, you could not enter the temple. Um, it came from a Levitical law, which was Leviticus 21, 17 through 20, but many of the rabbis extrapolated from that and from 2 Samuel 5, 8 and eventually made it where no one who had a birth defect could come into the temple and worship. So this guy could lay outside of this beautiful gate but never come in. You know, he, he, he sat there every day never able to worship his God. They would bring him the parts of the sacrifice that he could take part in, but he would never be able to go in and see that sacrifice that was being made for him. That's something that he could not experience because he was crippled from birth, because he was born with an ailment. You know, and you and I, and, and you can see a, a spiritual, you know, crossover here because you and I are born in sin. We're born crippled spiritually. And we, you and I, we can't approach God on our own as it is. That is one of the reasons that Jesus Christ had to come and die for us. It's our choice, yes, but it's entirely his doing. He carries us into the temple before God. And we know that Jesus actually bucked this trend as well. If you were to look at Matthew 21, 14, it, you know, you don't have to turn there, but it says the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. So people who normally weren't allowed in the temple, Jesus bid them come. So man may keep people away from God because of their nature, because they're sinners, uh, because they're struggling, because, you know, maybe he's not right or maybe they're not right or maybe they're, but God says come. And he brings them in to heal them. But here is this man. He is crippled and never able to enter in. And when Peter and John, you know, when he sees them coming in, you know, he asked them for alms. And I've actually heard someone teach it's because they looked like they had money, because they were dressed really well. That's not true. How many of you know you can go to rich neighborhoods and they'll take money before they give money, Right? The people that give the most tend to be the people that have the least. 
And you and I, we come into this and we see these things, and he doesn't look at them. He, he's asking for alms from everybody because he's dying. He's starving to death. He's, you know, he is a crippled man that someone had to carry and put by this gate. Verse 4, and fixing his eyes on them with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. And this is one of the things that we see right here is, we, you know, because you begin to pick this apart. Again, we talked about how some people teach that you have to have faith to come to God and ask for something. But understand that right now at this moment, this man doesn't even know who they are. He may have seen them before, but he's seen millions of people come through there. He doesn't know who they are. He's expecting alms. He's not expecting anything. His faith is in material things at this very moment. He's not, you know, he's not thinking about God. He doesn't say, heal me, guys. He says, do you have money? Do you got a dime, brother? Right? That's what he's saying. Alms, alms, alms for the poor. And to the Jews, that was one of the things that made you a good Jew was giving alms to the poor. But at this very moment, this guy's not coming to them in faith. The only thing he expects is a penny or two, hoping that he can have a meal by the end of the day. His only faith is that if I don't have money, I'm going to die. That's the extent of his faith at this moment. There's nothing in the scriptures that indicates anything more than a, I need money. That's it. But Peter says, verse 6, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. And he took him by the right hand. That's it. He snatched. He grabbed him. He took him by the right hand and he snatched him up. He lifted him up. He snatched him. <laughs> he snatched him up and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. It's incredible. You know, we, we get the idea that, you know, because he says, Peter, the first thing that Peter says is, I'm broke, yo. I ain't got nothing. I got nothing for you. Silver and gold I do not have. Most of us, you know, and, and especially in, in a modern Western Christianity, our idea of blessing is, you know, a good car, a good home, uh, a good job. Um, you know, we consider that to be a blessing, even though many times those things will keep us from actually being blessed because we will spend our entire lives trying to keep them, right? But he doesn't, he just says silver or gold, uh, Silver or gold would leave this man crippled on the ground still. Silver or gold would not help this man. It may feed him at the end of the day. The blessing of material things comes when we do not spend every waking moment trying to keep them, when we realize they are a gift from him. And, you know, it's that whole thing of, not being owned by your possessions, but owning them. But Peter and John are broke. And the one thing that he had to give, the one thing that he believed that he could do for him, he did. And he followed the teachings of his master, who in Matthew 10, 8 said, Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Freely. It's amazing that so many ministries that claim to be doing a work of God base everything they do off of whether or not you're a prayer partner and if you've sent in a donation that is of enough value that they may send you something in return that you could then possibly put in your wallet and grow money in it. You know, we have these people who abuse the authority of God and use it as a way to get money from people when here are these broke men that go to this broken man and then they heal him. Not by their own power, not by their own doing, but it says in the name of, it says. And that in the name of is that whole idea of, because names in the Bible, they aren't just labels like we use them, right? Some of our parents picked our names because they really liked, you know, somebody named their kid like Ziggy Stardust or, you know, or, or, or um, you know, Moon Zappa and, 
you know, which for some people that may be cool and hey, that's great. But again, names in the Bible aren't just a label. They mean something. They speak of the character of the person that it's named after. They speak of the name of the bear. It's not a magic word. It's a, I am, when he says in the name of, it's I'm acting in the authority of. Because it's the same thing that you and I might do, or, you know, you may go to a wedding and you may hear the pastor at the end of the wedding say, by the authority invested in me by the state of Texas, you know, and, and by Almighty God, I now pronounce you man and wife. That is stating that the state of Texas has said, as a pastor, I can perform a wedding ceremony and it is legally binding upon the couple. You see? And they come and they say, Jesus has given us authority to heal on this earth. And it is in that authority that he has given that we now act and say, you are healed. Again, not by Peter and not by faith. It is by Jesus. It is Jesus that heals this man. This is the healing ministry of Jesus Christ at work through Peter. This is not a faith healing. Understand that. It is a healing done by Jesus, and it is done through faith and authority in him. He doesn't have faith in faith. He doesn't have faith that his faith can do something. He has faith in Jesus. And that's probably one of the things that happened with my aunt that I never got to meet because she died five years before I was born. It wasn't her faith that was weak. It was there was no faith there to begin with. There was no faith that operation in what was going on. The problem wasn't she had no faith. The problem was the man laying hands on her who was claiming and calling out in the name of Jesus Christ had no faith. Or was simply a charlatan and a liar. This, this is something that is going on that is incredible. Dr. Luke, remember Luke is a doctor. Dr. Luke specifies the parts of this guy that are healed when this happens. This is so miraculous. You know, this is such an incredible event that is going on here that he says, okay, number one, this is another detail that reminds us that this is a eyewitness testimony. Because this person doesn't say, you know, he grabbed him and lifted him up. He says he grabbed him by his right hand. That's very specific, especially for writings of this ancient, you know, these ancient documents. You know, that's not the way, that's not the descriptive terms they would use. This is very specific in how it states that he grabbed him by his right hand and lifted him up. And then it says in the Greek that his feet and ankles receive strength, which is stereo, which is to make firm or solid. So it, as we see that, what is something that's not firm or solid? It just, you know, it, it wiggles around. It has no strength. It has no foundation. It can't be stood upon. And when he pulls him up, he is no longer a crippled, but he is healed instantaneously it's not a gradual you know not a gradual thing where you know they put some oil on his leg and then come back in a day and then do some oil on his leg and then come it is instant it is beyond the shadow of a doubt a miracle and no doubt he describes it in such detail number one because he's a doctor so when people are telling him here's how it happened here's what happened I wonder if Luke even talked to the man that it happened to. I would think he would name him if he did that. But he talks to Peter and he talks to John and anybody else that was there with him and says his ankle was made solid. His feet and his ankle became firm enough for him to stand upon. It is a miracle beyond doubt. Verse 8, so he leaping, stood up and walked, entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. I can remember a time uh, way back when um, where we were laying hands on a young girl who was deaf. And, uh, you know, and there were 12, 14 people praying 
seeking God, laying hands on this little girl, and then she could hear. And then she began to call out and she began to talk. And, you know, some of you may have seen YouTube videos of people that get those implants and they can hear for the first time and how emotional they are. And that was this girl when she got to hear. You know, she couldn't believe the sounds that were coming out. She began to make sounds herself so she could hear them. And, you know, and it was crazy and it was awesome and it was beautiful. But here, and that's what's going on with this guy. He can walk. He can heal. You know, and it's like, He's not just walking, you know, he's like dancing. He's leaping. He's praising God, you know. I'm, I'm not going to do it up here because I'm just I'm not. <laughs> you know? I was going to do some ballet because George was trying to get me to do it early, but I'm not going to do it, you know. Pull off some Gene Kelly for you, but that ain't happening. Um, more like I'd probably pull off Jack Black maybe, but even he's probably a little bit more uh, uh, acrobatic than I am. But, you know, he, There is an obvious change in him. And this is one of the things that we see oftentimes even in a salvation event. When someone comes to know Christ, when someone encounters Christ, you can't can't encounter the living God and walk away from that unscathed. You are either going to be changed where you realize he is true, and if you realize he is true and you believe in who Jesus was and what he did and all these things, then he comes to dwell in you, and that changes you. You can't be the same afterwards, or you're going to reject him all the more. But people change when they meet him. And it's something that the people can't deny it. You know, it's the same way as the blind man in chapter 9 of John, you know, where he, he, he got healed and he came back. And he goes back to all the people that knew he was blind and said, Hey, I see you now. I see you. I see you. you know, and all these people were going, you, you can't be you. You can't heal someone that's born blind. It was amazing. It was blowing their minds. And then here, same thing. What God did through his servant Jesus Christ, he's now doing through his servants, Peter and John. And when pressed, you know, in John chapter 9, when that guy was pressed, you know, they, were, they, they came to him and they were like, you, you know, you can't be giving Jesus his credit. You can't be doing that stuff. You need to just give glory to God. And back then he said, well, you know, they were like, you admit that this guy is just a sinner, a nobody, and, and then give glory to God. And he says in verse 9, 25, chapter 9, verse 25 of John, he says, whether he's a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. And this man... He was a cripple, but he ain't a cripple no more. And that's the same thing with you and I often. And again, you know, he's dancing like a crazed monkey dude, right? He is, you know, tiptoeing through the tulips here, and he is following Peter, you know, because they're like, okay, man, you're healed, great. Okay, we're going to prayer. And this guy's like trailing them. And they're like, okay, we're going to prayer now, right? And this guy's still, woo, yeah, woo, praise God, thank you, woo, woo. And he's doing all these things, and no doubt, because whose name did they heal him in? What was the authority they healed him in? Jesus. He may not even know who Jesus is yet, but who's he praising? You know. Hey, they did it in Jesus' name, right? You know, it's that one of those things where it's like people can go, well, you don't know the theological implications of the teaching. I don't care. I got healed in Jesus' name, right? I don't, you know, you don't care whether you're a Calvinist or an Arminian. You don't care whether you believe in this, that, or the other thing. As I met Jesus Christ, he healed me in your face. I'm done. Right? What, what is somebody going to say to you when God saves you? Are they going to say, well, did you come to, you know, was there salvific implications? And, you know, were, were you saved before you believed? Or were you, did you believe and then you were saved? And you say, I don't know, I met Jesus and I'm saved. Get out of my face. I don't care. Right? I don't need to know all that. I don't need to know those things. I need to know that if I meet Jesus Christ and if I introduce Jesus Christ to people, he can heal them and he can bring to them a life that I cannot do. This guy went from being carried to dancing like an insane man, just like David did when the Ark of the Covenant was returned to Israel after having been taken. In 2 Samuel 6, 14a, it says, David danced before the Lord with all of his might when it was coming back in to Jerusalem. 
And notice, he, you know, he does. He comes in with them. He was in the door, never able to come in and worship in the temple. And now where is he dancing? He's dancing in the temple. He is dancing in the presence of the Lord. This man who was forbidden to come in is now proper, accepted, and comes in in the name of Jesus Christ, praising God as he does. Verse 10, Then they knew it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. How many years had he sat at that gate? How many times did Jesus pass him and not heal him? How many people were there that grew up giving alms to this guy? I remember, I remember that dude's been crippled since I was like 12, right? It's that same thing when you got those people that kind of hang around the neighborhoods and they've been bad, you know? It's like, I remember when I was in fourth grade with that dude, he used to beat us up and take our money. And now he's a pastor because God did a miracle in his life and completely changed him because you knew what he was like at the core. But now that core has been changed. A new life has entered in. And here, this guy, they, they see it is so obvious. There is no denying, you know. He's not wearing really weird shoes or big shin splints or nothing like that. This guy is dancing and leaping, and they are amazed. You know, and that's one of the things... Most of you know you have, you know, one person in your life. For most of us, it's you yourself. I've heard some of your testimonies. They're beautiful. Amazing. Because God did a work in you. God did an obvious change in you. Because you had tried to change yourself before. You tried to do a work in yourself. You tried to... Heal your own crippleness by deciding how you were going to behave towards God. You were going to follow some rules, do some things, live a good life, earn some points with God, and it never worked out. But then when you finally met Him, when you finally trusted Him, it changed everything for you. And there are people in your lives who have seen you, who have known you their whole life, who now look at you and go, something's different. You're not who you were. There's something different about you. Because it's something that is done by Him. And it is an obvious miracle to those that witness it. And this was an obvious miracle to these things. Even though it's a, you know, for most of us, we would look at it and say it's a subjective experience. But this, God uses this subjective experience to bring people into a place where they can hear the Word of God and be saved. He didn't just heal him. And walk away and go, hey, we're going to be be here every weekend. We're going to set up a tent, you know, bring your spare change and all that good stuff, and we're going, right? He didn't do that. He, you know, he did a miracle to bring people in to hear the word of God and be saved. So that's the miracle, and now we're going to look at, now wait a minute, in verses 11 and 12, because Peter starts going, wait, whoa, wait, wait, whoa, what? Right? Verse 11. Now as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, so he's no longer dancing around, leaping like crazy, or he is, but he's still holding on to them. Have you ever, you know, it's like it's like when you got a kid on you, and they're like, oh, hey, and they're just having a blast. You know, you're at Astro World or something, and they're going nuts, right, and holding on to you because you said, do not let go of my hand, and you're like this. Right? I can only imagine that they're kind of like, oh, my God, all right? Oh, we just want to pray, bro, right? And, and then this guy, man, he's like holding on to them. All the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's. So they had walked all the way to Solomon's porch, right? You've got to remember that the temple area, I, I want to say it's like what, like three football fields? It's, it's huge, Okay. It's ginormous. And, and here they're walking, and they got this guy, and they make it all the way over to Solomon's porch, which was beautiful. It had these beautiful stone columns, and that was the place where Jesus would often go and preach and teach. 
and they make it all the way to there, and people are running to them because this guy is putting on a show, right? The people were drawn, but here's the thing that Peter begins to see. He begins to see that there's a danger here. And here's and we're going to see this in, in, in verse 12 because oftentimes when God does a great work through men, we think it's because God is approving of us. We really do. Because it, it happens, man. Uh, you know, I'll get a, a whole lot of money in from something or something will come in and you'll be like, yes, yes, that is exactly what I needed when it really wasn't. Um, we, we, you know, we as men oftentimes will get a gift from God, you know, whether it's something, you know, material or whether it's something spiritual, we'll get this gift. A man will touch someone and they'll be healed. And the next thing you know, they've got a ministry, right? <coughs> Come to Bob's house of miracles, you know, uh, you, you, you bring them in and, and we, we ship them out and ready to go for God, right? That kind of thing. Um, and, and just to let you know, before we begin service, and I actually, I actually had this happen, um, where we would go to places that would promise those same kind of miracles in the first 30 minutes, which of course was not recorded for the public. The first 30 minutes was an entire message that was done every single time on why you should give and why you should give till it hurt. 30 minutes every Sunday before all the miracles and, and, the, and the everything else started up. This is a danger that happens to us when we begin to see spiritual things in our lives because it can draw us away from pointing to him to pointing to us to attract the attention. It reminds me of Paul and Barnabas and Lystra. Though the Jews here wouldn't worship them, they would give them credit and they would promote them because that was that's the goal for many preachers or pastors is to promote themselves or the ministry. But when God is truly involved, the Holy Spirit, Jesus tells us in John 15, 26, when the Helper comes, whom I shall send you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he's going to make you guys really awesome. No, he doesn't say that. He's going to give you guys superpowers. He doesn't say that. He's going to give you guys ministries where you can buy a jet and a helicopter. He doesn't say that. He says he will testify of me. If a person or a ministry is truly filled with the Holy Spirit, they're not going to have Holy Spirit meetings. They're not going to have miracle meetings. They're not going to have healing meetings. They're going to have Jesus meetings because the Holy Spirit testifies of Jesus Christ. And if you encounter Jesus Christ, he will change your life. Not me, not Calvary Chapel, you know, not Bob's House of Miracles down the street, but Jesus Christ. He is your focus if you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Because we had talked about this, being filled with the Holy Spirit, being a spirit-filled believer is not a title. It is a state of being. Are you being filled with him? Peter sees this in verse 12. Peter saw it. He responded to the people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Why would you look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? Peter makes some very plain statements here. You look at this, man. When this man was healed, there was no blowing winds, no crescendo of music in the background. You know, John wasn't back there going, dun, 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 right? He wasn't doing anything. You know, there's no, you know, nobody's eyes are glowing. They're not shaking. And, oh, you know, there's none of that. Nothing. He goes, hey, man, you're healed. That's it. That's it. It's not the, the show is the dude that gets healed, not the healing and everything that happens. He snatches this guy up. It's not by any power that they have or any theatrics that they do. When you look at the servants, when you look at the servants, you're taking your eyes off the master. And Peter right now dismisses healing ministries and deliverance ministries in Toto, right here. Why? 
Because the focus becomes about the servant and the person instead of Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit has already told us He will testify of Him. We don't have power. Our faith is only as strong as the one that we place it in. A faith that convinces you of anything else is just self-deception. You're, just, you're fooling yourself. Because you're looking at a circumstance or an act instead of at Jesus Christ. God does, you know, he, and he says here, it's not because of our own power or godliness. You know, God calls us to be pure, holy, godly for him. But it's not like a pay-for-play kind of thing. It's not like, hey, Jesus, I was really good this week. I would really love to see you do something now, you know, kind of tit-for-tat, back-and-forth kind of thing. That's not the way it goes. He, Jesus, wanted to heal this man, and he did. I'm going to read verse 16 using the ISV because Peter later on is going to expound on this particular thing. When he says, and you can read along in verse 16, or I'll just read it here. Um, Verse 16, and in his name, he's explaining to them a little later on, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through who? Through him, through Jesus. The faith that comes through Jesus has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. All. And it's all through Jesus. All centered and focused on Jesus. You know, it's not denying the objective evidence of a healed life. Or the subjective joy and wonder, the reality of a risen Savior moving in their midst. It's you have seen this happen. Now look to Jesus, not to anything else, not to anyone else. Peter says, don't look at us, look at him. Because if you focus on him and, you know, it's how it's how we grow, it's how we come up, it's how you and I become believers in him and begin to see it affecting the lives of other people. In closing, we see this. We see Peter and John, as much as the man accepted, you know, expected alms from them. And again, you and I tend to look at people that are godly, people that seem to be holy, people that seem to be walking right with God, and we think they've got something that we don't. But they don't. It's just faith. Through faith, this miracle was not from them. It was from him. They were just the vehicle through which it came. Now, had they been ungodly, had they been unruly, would God have used them? He's used some awfully strange people in the past. One of the greatest examples we have is David. That guy was messed up. Go read First and Second Samuel, right? You and I look at this, and we have to come to know and understand that we, we are not good because we're earning points and because, of, you know, if we fill up with God fuel, then we'll be able to put it out. That's not the way it works. Jesus said, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can move mountains. Why? Because if, if I have more faith, can I do more things? No. Because if I have the smallest amount of faith in the God of the universe, he can move the universe to suit anything needs to be done. My faith is in him, not in my faith. Some might ask, you might look at this and go, well, okay, well, God did that for them. So do I not have faith? Why doesn't God heal everyone? Why didn't Jesus heal this guy? You know, why did Jesus just walk past him? Was it just so Peter could come later on and do it? That seems kind of cruel. Hey, I'm going to leave you as a cripple so my buddy can come later and, you know, really, you know, get 3,000 people saved. That's awesome, right? You know, does that sound like a God? Why do innocents suffer? Why do so many people who are so obviously good go through these things? You know, and again, there's, you know, there's no short answer. 
You know, that's a whole message that we could go through, and we're not going to go through that there. The, the short answer in the midst of it all is we live in a fallen, broken world in a place of pain. And, and, and sometimes in the midst of that pain, there's a crippled man sitting by a gate, and God decides to use him to display his glory and for people to get saved. Sometimes God heals your heart in the midst of your pain, and people see that no matter what you're going through, you are so in love with him, and that itself is a miracle. In the midst of this pain, just like this crippled man, you know, the man looks at them, he's unable to help himself, and it's just like you and I, we are unable to help ourselves, and we have to look to Jesus for help. This man received new legs, but no doubt, as he hears the message that Peter has, is going to receive something infinitely more valuable, eternal life. He is going to receive the Holy Spirit, that life of God returning to man that left at the beginning of creation. And if you truly believe in him, if you truly believe the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, that he died for the world, If you really believe that he was lifted up for your sins, that he died for three days and rose again from the dead, if you believe that in your heart, you will be saved. You will find repentance, and you will find a desire that was not there before, a life. You will be a new creation, the Bible says. Because when you truly look at him, you turn from that life and you turn to eternal life. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. If you would, stand with me and let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, we thank you so much, Lord, for your word. Your word that reveals to us things, Lord, that when we begin to see it, when we begin to understand it, Lord, and to delve into it, and we just look at what your word has for us, it changes the way we see so many things, Lord. Not, not bringing in our presuppositions or things that we think it's all about, but the truth of what your word says to us. Lord God, I pray that if there's anyone here, Lord, that needs healing, that they would seek brothers and sisters around them and say, pray for me. Because the same spirit that was in Peter, that same Holy Spirit, you dwell in us. And, Father, we, we act in faith, not a faith in us, not a faith that looks to us to accomplish anything, but completely, wholly, and totally trusting in you. My trust, Lord, our trust is in you, not in anything that we can do, not in anything that we can accomplish, but in you. And, Father, I pray, Lord, that we would seek to be healed in our hearts and in our bodies. Lord, you said that you would. And you said that you will. So I pray that we would act in that faith. Believing, Lord. Even when the circumstances in our life give us reason not to believe. Father, Hebrews tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to not look at ourselves, but to look at you. We thank you, Father. We give this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. As you know, if there's ever a time where if you're in the fellowship and you hear the gospel and God moves upon your heart to give your life to him, please come and see me afterwards. I would love to give you some materials and some things that you can go through. Um, if you're struggling in life and you just need prayer, um, grab a brother or sister in the, fe in the fellowship and say, hey, pray for me. I'm struggling. You know, if you're not ready to go into detail, that's cool. Don't go into detail. The Holy Spirit knows. Um, and who knows? The Holy Spirit may pray for them in a, in, in a way that even you didn't know you needed. So it's, it's awesome when we can look to each other um, to be the body to each other and minister.